All right, so I finished talking about the Superman movies, and we're going to continue going down the path to the road to Justice League. And if you couldn't tell by my shirt, I'm going to be talking about the Batman movies from 1989 to 1997. Now, just like with Richard Donner's Superman, I have reviewed Tim Burton's Batman on this channel before, but that was like my first year on this channel, and I was still getting into the groove of how I wanted to do these movie reviews. So now that I've perfected my craft, and now that we have Justice League coming up, which has both Superman and Batman in it, now's the time to give a much better review for Tim Burton's Batman. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. Tim Burton's Batman, or simply known as Batman, came out in 1989. It was directed by Tim Burton after coming off the success of movies like Beetlejuice and Pee-wee's Big Adventure. It stars Michael Keaton as the Cape Crusader himself, and Jack Nicholson as the Clown Prince of Crime, the Joker. The movie takes place during Gotham City's 200th anniversary. However, this 200 year anniversary is about to get a little more interesting with the presence of the Joker, who was once a member of one of the top mob guys in Gotham City, has now gone independent, and pretty much wants to give the city an anniversary that they'll never forget. However, to stop the Joker's evil plans, we have this mysterious vigilante who goes out at night and goes by the name of Batman. And it gets a little more interesting when these two characters find out later on that they might have had some personal history with each other long ago. So there have been a lot of previous Batman movies beforehand. There were some older serials back in the 30s and 40s. There was the Adam West TV series, rest in peace Adam West. And that series even had a feature film which came out the year the series started. And that series definitely put Batman into the pop culture. And it's one of the reasons why he's a little more popular than Superman just because Thanks to that show, he appealed to a more mainstream audience. Huh? But that was a more goofy style of Batman. It wasn't until Frank Miller wrote The Dark Knight Returns that put Batman back into being the serious, gritty Batman. Huh? And it kind of established that character in the comics huh? to be the way that we all know him to be now. And because of The Dark Knight Returns, that opened up leeway to a new Batman movie and a more serious approach to the character, and thus we got Tim Burton's Batman, which I love. I don't remember much of the old review that I did, but before watching this movie beforehand, I thought it was a near flawless movie. Like, I loved everything about it. Watching it in prep for this review, though, now that I'm actually observing it and taking notes, it's still really great. I still love it a lot, but I definitely start to notice a lot of problems with this movie. Not enough to ruin it though, but when people say that they're not a big fan of the Tim Burton Batman, I can kind of see why. But I'm going to save the bad things for near the end of the review because I want to get all the great stuff out of the way. This is obviously a Tim Burton movie, so the two things that you know you're going to get from his movies is a great visual look to it and a fantastic score by Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman working with Tim Burton is pretty much like John Williams working with Steven Spielberg. You know that every score made to their respective films is going to be excellent. And the theme that Danny Elfman has created for Batman is the single best Batman theme ever ever made. I know Hans Zimmer did a great rendition of Batman's theme in The Dark Knight, a completely different rendition, and it works for that series, but for me, the definitive Batman theme is Danny Elfman's because it's dark, it's somewhat mysterious, a little quirky in the style of Danny Elfman, Tim Burton scores, and it's triumphant. Something that I really don't get the full impression of with Hans Zimmer's scores. And then the second thing you get with Tim Burton movies is a fantastic visual look. One of the things about this series that I generally prefer over the Christopher Reeve Superman movies is the look of Gotham City, because Metropolis was pretty much New York City. Gotham City is a combination of matte paintings, models, and just great production design, and it gives the city its own identity. Much like with Blade Runner, the look of Gotham City in Tim Burton's movies, and to an extent even Joel Schumacher's films, is iconic. You remember all the little details of it, and it just has a fantastic visual flair to it. All these little details truly help make Gotham City feel like a character itself. Now let's get into the characters. We have Michael Keaton as Batman slash Bruce Wayne, who, in my opinion, after a lot of consideration, I 
think is the definitive Batman. When I reviewed Batman vs. Superman, I said that Ben Affleck is the best Batman because he gets Bruce Wayne and Batman down correctly. And yeah, he is a good Batman, I think. But thinking back on it, the reason I have now turned back to Michael Keaton as my favorite Batman is because he's very calm, relaxed, but he can still be very menacing when around criminals. And plus, he's the only Batman that can come across as intimidating while smiling at you at the same time because he's just that good at his job. And also, Michael Keaton's Batman voice is more natural. It's different enough to where you can't really tell that it's Bruce Wayne's voice, but it also doesn't feel completely growly like Christian Bale's Batman voice, or as cybernetic as Ben Affleck's Batman voice. Which I guess between those two, I would prefer Ben Affleck's cybernetic voice, because at least it's a built-in modifier, as opposed to Christian Bale, who sounds like he has throat cancer, so... I don't know. So that's ultimately the reason why I prefer Michael Keaton as Batman. And when you look at him as Bruce Wayne, he also works well because he's very unassuming. The way Michael Keaton acts and the way that you look at him as Bruce Wayne, you wouldn't think for a second that this guy would go out in the middle of the night and fight crime because he's that calm and he's that cool. And in fact, a lot of people before this movie came out petitioned that Michael Keaton would not be in the movie. And from what I've heard, the reason people petitioned was because they didn't want the Mr. Mom guy to be Batman. And this all happened before there was even an internet. But I think casting Michael Keaton was the best choice imaginable. It's just like when I heard Chris Evans being cast as Captain America, or when I heard that Robert Downey Jr. was going to be cast as Iron Man, I was like, oh no, come on. Because with Robert Downey Jr., he had all the legal issues going on, and with Chris Evans, I still had the bad taste of Fantastic Four in my mouth when he was the Human Torch, but on both occasions, I was wrong. And so with Michael Keaton as Batman, I'm sure he definitely proved a lot of people wrong as well. I also love how the movie doesn't go into the origin story within full detail. In fact, the movie opens up with the character of Batman, so we don't have to sit through the beginning of the movie seeing his parents get shot or how he actually becomes Batman, the movie starts and he's already Batman. We get a little scene of his parents getting shot, but I'll get back to that a little later because now it's time to talk about the other big character in the movie, the Joker, played by Jack Nicholson. I will say this right now. While I do prefer Michael Keaton's Batman over Christian Bale's Batman, Heath Ledger will always be my favorite live-action Joker. But in terms of Jack Nicholson, he was kind of born to play this role to begin with. True, his voice is very much Jack Nicholson's voice. He doesn't do anything that unique. But the makeup job on the Joker is incredible. His energy and charisma is incredible. And his performance overall is just pure excellence. Jack Nicholson's Joker here is very much a crime boss. He does have plans set into place, so he's not completely unpredictable, but there are certain points where he can be unpredictable. You just watch him, and you do feel a little hesitant when around him, because you're never quite sure what he's gonna do. He's just that good. And again, while I prefer Heath Ledger as my favorite live-action Joker overall, it's not fair to compare the two because Jack Nicholson's Joker is more of a crime boss, whereas Heath Ledger's Joker is just a psychotic nutcase who wants to spread anarchy and chaos throughout Gotham. So both Jokers are fantastic, but neither of them will ever beat Mark Hamill's Joker. Now the one interesting thing about this movie, and something that a lot of people, especially hardcore comic fans, criticize, is that the movie seems to be a little more focused on the Joker. Because we get to see the Joker's origin story, uh, we get to see the Joker before he fell into the pool of acid when he was Jack Napier, just a hired hand, and then we also get to find out that he is the same guy who murdered Bruce Wayne's parents, which a lot of people have an issue with that, that the Joker was the one that murdered Bruce Wayne's parents. And yeah, it's different from the comics, but just for the movie adaptation, I think it's an interesting choice because it makes the hero-villain dynamic a lot more interesting, and it gives more of a reason for both guys to hate each other. Because as Batman put it, he made the Joker, and the Joker made Batman first. Because the Joker, when he was just Jack Napier, shot Bruce Wayne's parents when he was a kid, and then when Bruce Wayne's Batman, he's responsible for Jack Napier falling into a pool of acid and becoming the Joker. And it's also interesting that during the actual events of the movie, they meet three times in every possible combination. Batman fights Jack Napier near the beginning of the movie before he becomes the Joker. The Joker invites himself into Vicki Vale's apartment where Bruce Wayne happens to be there. And the two of them exchange a little dialogue in the sense that Bruce Wayne knows who the Joker is. And then in the finale of the movie, they finally face off as the Joker and Batman. So yeah, it's a change that a lot of people 
have issues with, but for me, I think it's a change that works for the sake of the story. Oh, and also they don't give that much detail of Batman himself, but I do kind of like that for this movie because it gives the character more mystery to him. And then compare that when you look at The Dark Knight, where we hardly know anything about the Joker, but we know a lot about Batman. There are two different adaptations that I think work in their own ways. You have a lot of really great supporting characters as well. You got Vicki Vale, played by Kim Basinger, who I really want to see in some newer live-action Batman movies, just because, for me personally, just based on what I know about Batman. Vicki Vale always seems to be to Batman what Lois Lane is to Superman or what Mary Jane Watson is to Spider-Man. So I'd like to see her in future live action movies, if that's possible. We also have Billy D. Williams who plays District Attorney Harvey Dent. It's a really small role, there's not a whole lot to say, but it is an important role considering a future movie, which we'll get into sooner or later. So overall, it's a fun cast. Uh, Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson are obviously the two standouts. And then you have Commissioner Gordon and Alfred, which are the only two consistent actors throughout the entire series. Uh, so there's not much else to say. Now, I still love this movie. It's my favorite Batman movie after The Dark Knight, but I did have some issues with it watching it and prep for this review. Some of them are nitpicks, but I feel like this is an instance where there's so many of them that they kind of help bring the movie's rating down for me. As awesome as Michael Keaton is as Batman, it is a little silly to see him turn around in the Batman suit to where he just can't move his neck. He just has to do this the whole time. And thank God I have a swirling chair for this review so I can do it a little easier even if I still look a little goofy doing it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a little silly but I still think Michael Keaton works as Batman. There are a few moments in the movie where it feels very outdated and by a few moments I mean two points where they play two songs from Prince. There's a scene when the Joker and his crew invade an art museum and they play Party Man and then during the Gotham City parade for its 200th anniversary they're playing Trust and there was even a music video that Prince made back in the day. It just really makes the movie feel outdated. Compare that to The Dark Knight. I'm gonna constantly be making comparisons back and forth because I love both movies so much, but when you look at The Dark Knight, that movie's almost 10 years old. Uh, it doesn't have anything that makes it feel outdated. Uh, everything you see in that movie stands the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. Uh, this movie, as much as I love it, uh, you could definitely tell it was made during the 80s because of those Prince songs. It's not enough to ruin the movie, but it definitely feels dated. Nothing that I would ever consider to be timeless. Now I have something that might be considered a nitpick, but it is something that makes me wonder if Batman went to the same school as the Stormtroopers when it comes to aiming and shooting. It's during the final battle when Batman is in the Batwing flying around and he's about to shoot the Joker who's in the middle of the street and is like, come on you gruesome son of a bitch, come and get me. And Batman has guns locked on him, he's got all kinds of missiles locked on him, and despite me preferring Batman not to kill anyone, this is the point after he discovers that the Joker was the one who killed his parents, so I can't really blame the guy. But he shoots, he shoots everything he has, but misses. He sh basically ends up shooting around the Joker, and the Joker's just standing out like this with his arms out, and you're like, what the fuck happened there? Like, it's something you just really can't explain. But then the Joker is able to pull a gun out of his pants, phrasing, uh, take aim and shoot the Batwing out of the sky in one shot. And that's enough for it to crash into the church and blow up. Ironically, not killing Batman in the process. So that's just one of those weird elements that I can't fully explain. I The best I could say is bad writing. But that's about all I have to say in terms of negativity, because overall, I still love Tim Burton's Batman. Sure, watching it again, it definitely has its issues, and there are certainly points where it's outdated. And even if you don't like the movie, you have to admit that without this movie, we wouldn't have had many of the other adaptations of Batman that would follow. Because The Dark Knight has a lot of scenes that are somewhat parallels to this movie, and even homages, like the Joker in the middle of the street, telling Batman to come towards him, the big finale on the side of the building. There are a lot of references to this movie in The Dark Knight. And plus, without this movie, we never would have gotten Batman the Animated Series, which in my opinion, more than The Dark Knight, more than this movie, is the single best adaptation of Batman. It's that good. 
It's something that I would love to do a review one day, but I gotta watch every episode before I even do that. So my rating for this, I can't quite say get off your ass and go see it right now because of those issues I had, but I am this close to saying that. So I'm just gonna say worth seeing in your lifetime, but go see it right now. Outside of the Dark Knight, this is my favorite Batman movie ever made, and it is definitely the most influential Batman movie out there. So I, I can't get enough of this. I love it. And that's my review for Tim Burton's Batman. Next week, we're going to talk about Tim Burton's second movie, Batman Returns, which I got to be honest, I've only seen once. So this will be interesting to rewatch. And until then, I hope you enjoyed this review. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on the movie, if and when you've seen it. And as always, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.